Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday morning to you all. Um, I'm so glad we got our PowerPoint going so nobody move. Uh, <laughs> so, um, well, I'm very excited to welcome you uh, all to this year's Concordia District uh, tour. And uh, I think what's gonna be hopefully fun for all of you today is that you're going to get a sneak peek into what these uh, some of these houses that you're going to be going through today look like when they were brand new in the 1890s and uh, what a great opportunity to uh, do a little time travel all in one day. So, um, well, I wanted to introduce you to Highland Boulevard the way uh, it was in the 1890s and this is actually from a, uh, a piece of letterhead uh, that was clearly uh, to entice you out to, to Highland Boulevard. And uh, what's interesting uh, to me is that this is what it looked like. <laughs> I, I like that those uh, four mansions, uh, you know, started out as four sheds. No, this was a little bit closer uh, to town, but um, I always try to think of Milwaukeeans in the 19th century and just how quickly the city was uh, transforming itself. And so the people that were building homes along Highland Boulevard would have known this, this era uh, along Prairie Street as Highland was then known. Just so you have a, a concept, and this is something that I get at the Paps Mansion all the time about what the neighborhood was like when the Paps Mansion was built uh, in 1892, that Prairie Street only ran, or Highland only ran as far as 12th Street until 1870. 1876, it was pushed out to 27th Street, and it wasn't until 1890 that it fully extended to 35th Street. So that just kind of gives you an idea of when the Paps Mansion was completed in 1892, the city line was actually at 27th Street. So that kind of gives you, we'd be in the outskirts of town uh, right now, uh, and that kind of shows you the power of the automobile and how that actually did uh, kind of transformed the city in the 20th century by people uh, moving uh, around. But again, as I was saying, this was the earlier days and this part of town really were farms uh, all the way up through the 1880s, Cold Spring Park, uh, which is actually where State Fair was held uh, beginning in the 1860s and 70s. We had a Civil War camp, Camp Washburn uh, was out here. But by the 1880s, I'd say late uh, 1889, when the Parks Commission was uh, created, and of course Highland Boulevard had uh, a role to play in kind of the gateway to West Park or what became known as uh, Washington Park, this part of town became very attractive. Um, I always think of Prospect Avenue and Grand Avenue as kind of, they happened. Uh, because they weren't planned, they were just kind of homes that were built along a main thoroughfare that uh, exited uh, the town in Prospect Avenue's uh, case to the north and of course with Grand Avenue to the west. But beginning in the 1880s and 1890s, you have this urbanization of laying things out on the grid and really trying to, to make plans. And of course, that's what uh, Highland Boulevard was all about, was a very grand uh, plan. And uh, this is such a, a great photograph of, again, those four homes, which were a bit of speculation, I think, with uh, uh, four friends, the Key Kafers, the Zins, the uh, Manigolds, and uh, the Krulls, who were all kind of in like businesses. And in doing the research for this presentation, you really start seeing how all these people were sitting on each other's boards. And, you know, this, this the, was a very tightly knit uh, neighborhood and of course it had this 130 foot broad boulevard and uh, that was to create uh, a very fine uh, neighborhood and very enticing. And what's interesting is these four homes were built right at the beginning of the 1890s and it took about another five years to, for people to kind of start uh, buying up some of the other lots. So this was a little bit of speculation on the part of these gentlemen. This is just kind of a map uh, that was printed in 1970 and just kind of shows you uh, the neighborhood that we're gonna be uh, talking about uh, tonight, uh, or this afternoon, this morning, sorry. 
I was up until 1.30 and then up at 5 this morning, so we're, <laughs> we're around the clock today. So uh, this uh, shows you these four homes, the Key Kafer House, the Zinn House, the Magold House, and the Kroll House. Those were the first four. And then uh, the uh, William Magold House, which you'll have the opportunity to visit today, was uh, on the south side of Highland Boulevard. And then the Pabst Homes, the Miller House, and the Usinger's House. So you could actually see how, of course, why this became known as Sauerkraut Boulevard. Uh, <laughs> and this was very, a very uh, Germanic uh, neighborhood. And this really was, I think, for that kind of next generation. So uh, the Milwaukee's kind of uh, older families were building on Prospect and um, on Grand Avenue. And so these were kind of the kids' homes on, on Highland Boulevard. So this was the the newer, the shinier, the, the brighter uh, uh, boulevard uh, to be on. So I can literally put uh, the Manigold family in almost any house on this street in one way or another through marriage, through business, and it's, it's really funny. So uh, the Man Charles Manigold house uh, is on the left, and he was with the Milwaukee Waukesha Brewing Company, and Adolf Zinn uh, was with Zinn Malting. So you can see brewing and malting uh, were, were together. They were neighbors. Uh, the Charles Manigold House, both of these homes were designed by Farron Kloss in 1891, so the architect uh, of the Pabst Mansion. And uh, the Manigold House uh, was eventually removed in 1962 uh, for the Highlander Apartments. And <laughs> It still has a stone facade, so, uh, <laughs> so, so that's, that's uh, and, and you can see how these homes, you know, they really were built for like one generation and then people moved either to, uh, to Lake Drive or they moved uh, further west into the highlands like the Gettlemans did uh, in the 1930s. So these really were kind of one generation homes. That most of them became rooming houses and eventually uh, when they were uh, at the end of their life expectancy, they were transformed into uh, apartment buildings. Adolf Zinn, uh, <laughs> uh, he should be in the malting business. Uh, so uh, he built, uh, again, this very, very fine home on Highland uh, Boulevard in 1891. Uh, we actually have Ferry and Kloss who are captured the architects uh, riding on horseback, getting themselves photographed in front of their, their latest uh, projects. Uh, the Zinn House eventually became the property of the A.O. Smith family. And in the 1920s, uh, it was sold to John Sachs, who was the president of the Sachs Amusement Company who owned the Oriental uh, Theater. Eventually, uh, this uh, house had 25 uh, different rooming uh, borders uh, in it and was torn down in the late 1960s. The Key Kafer uh, residence, which was right on that corner of 29th and um, um, Highland Boulevard, Mr. Key Kafer was the president of the uh, National Enameling uh, Company, so NESCO, uh, and he and his brother Ferdinand, who lived on Grand Avenue, uh, was in this house for uh, a number of years before it was eventually uh, became a VH, uh, uh, VFW post. And a fire in 1948 <laughs> uh, took it away and eventually it was replaced too. So that uh, this image of these four homes were eventually replaced with these uh, four apartment buildings. So you can picture those first four homes uh, where, where they once were. Speculative land, come build here. So this was uh, a photograph taken around 1895, looking east uh, towards the city. Uh, in the distance, you have those four homes and you have one outlier here that uh, has been built, but we're gonna be looking at these couple of lots uh, right here. So this is uh, Fred and Ida Pabst, uh, or yeah, this is Fred Pabst Jr. and I was gonna call her Ida Pabst Jr. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> uh, Ida Eline Pabst. Uh, they were on their honeymoon in, when this photo was taken and uh, they were married at the Fister Hotel on March 25th, 1896. And like every dutiful father, uh, Captain Paps decided to uh, build a house 
uh, for them when they weren't in town. So, you know, <laughs> not that you're gonna have any say in it, no. <laughs> uh, so he, Captain Pabst did acquire the property for a house for them on um, Highland Boulevard. And uh, they hired, uh, a, I'll build you a house uh, with his cigar. <laughs> uh, Max Fernicke Sr. <laughs> Uh, was was an architect uh, who had actually been uh, child uh, friends with uh, Fred Pabst Jr. They went to grade school together. And so uh, Fred Pabst uh, had uh, his grade school uh, chum uh, design uh, a house for them. And this was uh, for uh, Max Fernicke's and his, uh, um, and the firm of Fernicke's and Dolliver, this was kind of their showpiece house. Um, and they did a number of homes around the city. Eventually would do almost a 20 year commission for Fred Pabst Jr. Uh, when he was building Pabst Farms in a Conwalk. Uh, but this was kind of a very high quality house. And if you're thinking about the cost of these homes, these were about uh, say, let's say $30,000 homes. Sounds like a deal uh, today, but um, as uh, many of you who have come to my lectures, I always like to throw in the caveat of what a working class salary was in the 1890s, which was between four and $500 a year. So even a $30,000 house, you'd have to work for 60 years pocketing every single dollar you made in order to afford a home like this, let alone a house like the Pabst Mansion or the Shandine House, which costs $300,000. So you'd actually have to work 600 years to afford that. So it, again, it just kind of puts into context what the real cost of these, uh, these homes were. Thanks to Pabst Family Photo Albums, uh, we have a great set of original interior photographs of the Fred Pabst Jr. House, which was completed in 1897. So these are a couple of views of the front hall that you will be in shortly. And uh, looking into the study, uh, Cyril Kalnick uh, was uh, a friend of the Paps family and did uh, some tremendous metal work uh, for this home. Unfortunately, now these chandeliers uh, have survived, uh, but uh, really uh, amazing. The front balcony of the Fred Paps Jr. house is Cyril Kalnick and survives. So the music room, uh, the Gothic uh, dining room, and so Fred Pabst Jr., who had um, been raised, obviously, to be part of the Pabst Brewing Company, um, had other aspirations, which were fostered by Captain Pabst, although I think Captain Pabst would have probably uh, rather have his son keep it as a hobby rather than uh, leaving the brewing industry at least for uh, some 20 years uh, to become a, um, a horse and Holstein uh, cow, uh, cattle breeder. And so here we have Fred Pabst Jr. Uh, in his stable yard with one of his prized hackney horses. Uh, of course, the, the Pabst family had their um, stock farm. Uh, literally, this was kind of the gateway to the Wauwatosa stock farm, which is now the Washington Highlands. And that's where he had developed his love of horse breeding. And so uh, shortly after this photograph was taken, uh, Fred Pabst Jr. Uh, put in his resignation at the Brewing Company and then a year later started Paps Farms in a Conwalk, which was a 1600 uh, acre farm that he ran uh, until his death in 1958. Eventually the house uh, was sold in 1908 uh, to Thomas Nisi, who had uh, held on to the house. Uh, by the 1930s it had become the first unity center of practical Christianity and then an 11 room uh, boarding house. In 1944, when this photograph was taken, it was purchased by the Engineer Society of Milwaukee and used as a clubhouse uh, for the better part of um, 25 years. By 1970, Mark Fowler, uh, the architect, and his associates had purchased the house and uh, moved their architectural firm into it. Um, and then it went back into being a... Um, a private home briefly um, about, about close to 20 years ago. And now Quorum Architects are in it uh, today. And I think the black and white photographs are amazing, but it's always that punch of that beautiful uh, Cream City brick that was used 
uh, for this house with those Bedford limestone uh, carvings that are just uh, exceptional. So next door, his older brother moves in and um, Gustav Pabst in the years just prior to this had gone through uh, what I'll term a rough patch. Uh, in 1892, he had met and eloped and didn't tell anybody uh, with an actress seven years his senior who was divorced. Uh, and um, this all kind of broke out in the papers and uh, the uh, marriage between Margaret Mather and Gustav Pabst really kind of put a strain on the, the family ties uh, at the time. And um, next time you're driving through the intersection of 27th and Kilbourne, think of Gustav Pabst being chased by his first wife with a buggy whip <laughs> because he had because the Pabst family had invited his wife to a theatrical performance. So it was and that that of course begat a very uh, public divorce in 1895-96. And um, by 1897 he had married for the second time to a brewing heiress uh, from St. Louis, so much more appropriate uh, uh, marriage, and so he had moved from a small cottage at, on 29th uh, Street to Highland Boulevard. So again, the, the, uh, the appreciation was uh, much greater for, for the, his second wife, uh, perhaps, than for his first. So this is a, kind of a really cool photograph of the Fred Pabst Jr. house, 1897, uh, and then the Gustav Pabst house built uh, the following year in 1898. And I kind of like this house that's under construction on the street uh, just behind uh, the Pabst property. Now, Hilda was actually his wife, Hilda Thusnelda Lemp. Uh, now, that really puts the sauerkraut into <laughs> Sauerkraut Boulevard, <laughs> Thusnelda. Um, <laughs> Her name is actually, was on the name of the title uh, for this house. And there's a very interesting um, deed restriction uh, when this property was sold to Gustav Pabst. And it really spells out, I was gonna read the whole thing to you, but it really spells out that no alcoholic or fermented beverage, no matter how viscous or viscous is used, uh, so a malt extract, there could be no tied house, no tavern that the Pabst family would ever build on that site. So for whatever reason, uh, they were suspicious that the Pabst family actually might put a, uh, a Pabst Brewing Company tied house there. And both brothers tried starting a horse riding school in their backyard and that came under, under fire. So maybe uh, there, there was a little bit to that story of, of the, the Paps always trying to start some sort of operation in their, in their back garden. So, uh, so for the Gustav Paps house, they had hired the architects uh, Alfred Kloss and George B. Ferry uh, to design uh, a home for Gustav and his wife, or Hilda and her husband, I should say. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have a very rare insight into the relationship between the architect and uh, the client. And so we have uh, three watercolor and, and also a pencil sketch of different concepts. So these were just, would have been presented in like an initial meeting uh, with Gustav and Hilda of what kind of house would you like? Would you like this uh, Flemish house? Would you like, <laughs> would you like a Georgian concept? or French Gothic, you know, pick your, pick, your, uh, pick your architectural style. And I think this really speaks to the versatility of our architects in that I think in the 21st century, we go to an architect for a look. In the 19th and early 20th century, architects could interpret all these different uh, schools of, of architecture uh, for the client if, if it was needed. So finally they chose kind of this uh, restrained uh, Flemish Renaissance revival style, which um, actually has a very light resemblance to uh, the Pabst Mansion uh, on uh, West Wisconsin Avenue. Uh, they move in and we have some, again, some wonderful photographs uh, of the interior of this house. And I really have always liked this 
grand staircase that goes up, splits, and then returns up to the second floor foyer. Uh, the little French uh, parlor with no chairs. I noticed that yesterday. I was like, I guess it was standing room only. Uh, <laughs> uh, the music room, uh, because it has the piano in it, and uh, the dining room. Now, there's, if you really start looking closely at these photographs, there, there's so much Tiffany Studios material in these rooms. The sconces are Tiffany Studios, as is this exceptional uh, light fixture over the dining room table, which unfortunately does not survive uh, in the house. And the second floor foyer, which again is just a really, really beautiful space. And at the end of that hall, you have uh, what was originally the study. Uh, so Gustav Pabst was, um, he, would, he would have been a fast car enthusiast in the 20th century, but he was a horse and carriage enthusiast in uh, the late 19th century. And because his head coachman kept a photo album, we actually have some great photographs of uh, the carriage house. So here are the stalls. Um, and he actually, or it was Fred Pabst Jr. that actually added uh, an addition to his stable. So he actually had 12 horses on his property. Uh, and this is the, not the five car garage, but the five carriage garage or carriage house. And um, it's, it's really funny when you start putting all these photographs together, Gustav loved having his wagons and the company's wagons photographed in front of the house on Highland Boulevard. So we have these great photographs. This was a nationally prized team of Percheron horses uh, that was put together in 1905-1906 uh, that went to the St. Louis World's Fair, won 10 awards. Uh, and here it is photographed uh, in front of the Gustav Pabst House. This was their park drag, uh, which was described as a picnic basket on wheels. Uh, this, this I, I, again, this, I really appreciate the opportunity to give this presentation to you because it, it gave me some time to actually think about that carriage cost $30,000. The house cost $30,000. So again, it's like putting those things next to one another. It's like, that is, that is interesting uh, indeed. That carriage still survives at the Wade House. So uh, next time, if you're up there this summer, definitely look up the, the Pabst uh, drag, which is uh, on display there. Uh, the Victoria, so we'll have that rolled out. And I like this action shot going down uh, Highland Boulevard, which is pretty great that the shutter speed was actually able to capture uh, the horses in full gallop. Uh, Fred Papps Jr. house is right there, and then the Lizette Miller house, which we'll be talking about in a minute, is directly behind. These are some photographs from uh, Papps family uh, albums uh, taken in the gardens at uh, the Highland Boulevard house. I just think this, these are two sweet photos of Gustav Papps with his son, Gustav Papps Jr., uh, on that uh, great Navajo rug. Uh, the, so there were cousins living next door to each other. So you had the Fred Paps Jr. children, you had the children of uh, Gustav Paps, And so these are uh, all first cousins ready to go into battle on the streets of Milwaukee with loaves and baguettes of bread. So, uh, <laughs> and so this was their, this was kind of their last, um, their last holiday in the house. Um, Captain Pabst died in 1904, and you know that really was kind of a earthquake moment within the Pabst uh, family because um, obviously they had more financial wherewithal to, to do different things. So uh, Gustav Pabst sold the house on Highland Boulevard and moved over to Terrace Avenue. Fred Jr. sold his house, moved over to a Conwalk, and uh, Gustav was now the president uh, of the Pabst Brewing Company. But Here's uh, everybody with their Easter baskets uh, with the porte cochere of the Gustav Pabst house behind them. So Frederick, Frederick Pritzloff uh, moved into the um, Gustav Pabst house um, in 1905 and then stayed until his death in 1951. And so that was probably one of the longest runs of any one 
family in one house on Highland Boulevard. And so um, eventually this was left to the Lutheran Welfare Society. And in 1953, it was, the house was turned into a daycare for 90 children. <laughs> Uh, and then eventually in the 1970s it became the Willow Glen uh, Academy and that's when the uh, addition was put uh, onto the front of the house. Um, and then from 1998 to 2012 it was the home of the Highland Community School and now is the home of the law offices Leverson, Lucy and Metz. And they've done a lot of work to the interior of the house so I think you're, you're really going to enjoy the, the look of that. And here it is uh, today. So we're, we're gonna shoot over to the Miller Brewing Company for a moment. And this is the home of Lizette and Frederick Miller, uh, built in the 1870s. And the house is still there. And so um, I put the address 3715 West Miller Lane, knock on the door. I'm sure they won't mind. No, excuse me. No, uh, but I do, I, I do encourage a drive-by because the, their bungalows were built in the 20th century right on the front lawn. So this house, you actually approach it obliquely uh, and you, you only see it from the side. The tower is still there, so just look for the tower and you'll kind of get your, your bearings. But this was built up on the bluff above the Miller Brewing Company. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Frederick Miller died in 1888. So he, you know, he has such a remarkable... Um, legacy in Milwaukee, but unfortunately he, he died m way before the Paps and the Elines uh, uh, did, and so he really uh, is kind of this more memorialized figure in Milwaukee Brewing. About 12 years after his death, his widow, uh, Lizette uh, Miller, uh, decides to build a house on Highland uh, Boulevard. The, the brewing company is doing very well under her son's um, uh, leadership. And so she actually builds what uh, was considered the largest home ever to have been built on Highland Boulevard. The building permit says $30,000. It's estimated closer that she spent $100,000 uh, on the house. And again, just for scale, I love these construction photos. This is a full-size craftsman standing next to the carriage entrance. And it really wasn't until I was looking at this photo again at 1.30 in the morning that, um, <laughs> that I was just really struck by the scale uh, of this house. And uh, they moved in in 1901. Home sweet home, really, really like that. And uh, Lizette Miller stayed there uh, for the rest of her life. Uh, and here she is with a family gathering probably around 1915. She died in 1920. Uh, the Miller family held on to the house uh, for a further two decades, and in 1944, it was actually conveyed to Marquette University, and this became um, a dormitory for 27 junior and senior women. Uh, so this was a girls' dormitory, and this was one of the first frat sorority houses uh, that appeared uh, on Highland Boulevard, which uh, would carry it through uh, a large part of the, the 20th century. Uh, eventually, the house was uh, torn down in 1966. And what was interesting about um, the carriage house was actually converted into a chapel uh, for uh, the uh, inhabitants of the house and the dining room and the kitchen was also relocated into the to the carriage house. So this was, it's hard to see, but this is this huge, and so judging by the size again of the craftsman, um, this was enormous, there were a pair of them, angel um, motifs that were holding up the cor corner tower. That element had survived and the salvage company didn't know what to do, with, so it just kind of left it on a vacant lot uh, on the east side of Milwaukee and then eventually uh, disappeared. But it must have weighed, I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds uh, of pounds. So I just wanted to reintroduce you to the Manigold uh, family. And we talked about Charles Manigold earlier. He had 
four brothers, uh, three of which had, uh, actually had five brothers, four of which had homes on Highland Boulevard. This one was at 2727 Highland Boulevard, is gone and was replaced by an apartment. Uh, but the one that you're going to today is William Manigold, uh, which, um, again, he was involved with the Milwaukee Waukesha Brewing Company. This house was built in 1897. Uh, designed by Jacob Jacoby, who was an early builder in Milwaukee, uh, going back to the 1860s, and then by the mid-1880s, moves more into the design uh, side of architecture. And he also designed the Kroll House that was across the street and, and no longer there. Um, this house uh, had served as a nursing home uh, from 1941 to 1973, and it was a residence for the Fathers of the Sacred Heart. And when this photo was taken in 1977, the caption stated, architectural contrasts are common on Highland Boulevard. <laughs> so, I, so even people were, were noticing at the time this kind of juxtaposition between mid-century modern architecture and Victorian architecture on Highland Boulevard. So our final home, uh, before I let you go out and see these places, uh, was the German Renaissance mansion designed in 1901 uh, for William Stark, who was president of the Lake Michigan uh, Dredge and Dock Company, and his wife Louisa was a manigold. <laughs> so again, uh, now the sister is, is part of this mix as well. So uh, Charles Crane, great, uh, facial hair here, uh, had just uh, ended a very successful partnership with Carl Barkhausen. So Crane and Barkhausen were kind of a powerhouse architectural uh, firm in Milwaukee. And they designed a number of high quality mansions all over the city on Prospect Avenue, Grand Avenue. And for all of us in this neighborhood, the Schuster Mansion at 32nd and Wells uh, was designed uh, by them. Um, the Stark uh, Mansion also gets it has the hallmarks of kind of a Crane and Barkhausen or and Crane's, sorry, you really can't see it here, but you'll be seeing it shortly. Uh, he always did these kind of massive uh, uh, pediments uh, at the top of the structure and highly ornamented. And I don't want you to miss the original railings uh, that are on that terrace, which uh, I'm sure are, were done by Cyril Kalnick. It, the Gettleman name gets associated with it because Stark's um, daughter, uh, Louise, marries uh, Frederick Gellman, who was an assistant brewmaster with Gellman uh, Brewing Company, uh, and eventually becomes the secretary, and then later uh, the president uh, of the company as well. And so that's why it's always referenced as uh, the Gettleman home, which uh, until the Gettlemans were there until their departure in 1933, uh, and then eventually becomes a Gamma Theta Pi uh, fraternity all the way through the 1980s and later a law office. And this house had a close call in 2001 when a fire broke out uh, kind of in the uh, southern end of the mansion uh, and unfortunately uh, was saved and has uh, been restored. And I just want to mention that Bradley and Cassia Carter have returned it to a single family home. So it's kind of over 80 years, things have come full circle. So, and there you go. Uh, well, I always have very abrupt endings to my presentations, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I hope this has kind of whetted your appetite and kind of giving you some context for what you're gonna see today. And I hope you have a wonderful time. It looks like the weather is gonna hold out for a little bit. So thank you.